Gentlemen, let's talk about Naomi Osaka and women's tennis. The 22-year-old tennis player of Haitian Japanese descent won her third Grand Slam at the US Open on Saturday, beating Victoria Azarenka of Belarus. Osaka's victory was the culmination of a fascinating campaign, both in terms of tennis and politics. In each of her seven matches, she wore a face mask with the name of a black American who had fallen victim to racism. George Floyd, of course, but also Breonna Taylor and Trevon Martin and Tamir Rice. Young men and women whose lives were snuffed out by a brutal racist system. Naomi Osaka was taking a stand, just as other sportspersons, such as basketball players in the US, had done earlier. And it was a vital stand to make at this point, as killings have continued in the US even after the massive protests following the murder of George Floyd. But Osaka's political statements are also part of a tradition in women's tennis of highlighting radical causes and struggling for it. A key part of this has also been the struggle for equal pay and prize money. We talked to NewsClick's Leslie Xavier on these issues. Thank you, Leslie, for joining us. So, uh, we, we see Naomi Osaka's statements that were made during the course of the US Open. And this is, of course, part of a, also a global tradition, so to speak, a global practice that has been going on around the world. There's, we've seen similar protests by basketball players in the United States, both the men, men's and women's players, and also a number of sportspersons, other celebrities raising issues around Black Lives Matter, racial justice. But today, to go, uh, to go into another aspect, uh, specifically about Naomi Osaka and also women's tennis as a whole. Uh, we have, we do know that there is a long tradition of women tennis players raising uh, the key issues of the time, standing in solidarity with protesters and uh, definitely also using the sport and the platform it provides to make some of these political points. So could you talk a bit about this and especially about the con that in the context of women's tennis itself? Uh, so largely, if you look at it in, in tennis history, it has been the women and not the men. I mean, and that continues even now in this generation. So if you look at uh, Black Lives moment, uh, Matter moment, uh, it's not the, I mean, yeah, some of the uh, men's player, tour players have come out and spoken about it at last, but no one has explicitly, explicitly took a stance like, like the one that was taken by Nayama. Naomi Osaka, and we are talking about some superstars here who have, who have a huge sway across fans, across brands, across all the, across society as a whole. So, I mean, someone like Roger Federer or Rafael Nadal, for instance. So that way, if you look back, if you go back into tennis history, the pro tour history to start with, every generation has had a Naomi, Naomi Osaka of sorts. So. Let's get back to uh, the 70s, late 60s, 70s, where Billie Jean King was ruling the courts. And a tremendous player, she... Uh, but what a pioneer, pioneer in, in the game itself, because she was one of the first persons who was very vocal about... And, that, and it was in a very early stage for women's tennis as such, women's professional tennis. And she was very vocal about equal pay status for both men and women. And uh, she pushed for it right through both us in the capacity as a player, while as a player. And at the same time, later when she became an administrator and played a prominent role in the Women's Tennis Association, WTA, uh, she pushed for it. She keeps continuing pushing for, for, for rights. Uh, and also at the same time, she was one of the first professional women athlete to come out as openly gay and subsequently she also was an activist for LGBTQ rights and uh, so here is a character who has uh, transcended sport though we keep talking about her with tennis as an yardstick saying that she fought for equal pay in, in the tennis realm but she but uh, she has been part of organizations which has worked outside as well and also at the same time, tennis is but a reflective a reflection of what was happening in the feminist movement in the 70s, if you look at it. Uh, the, the period was defined by such struggles in all walks of life. And Billie Jean King and, and her contemporaries, the women players of, of her time, uh, just, just carried it forward into, into their realm, into, into tennis. But of course, the establishment, there was, there was uh, I mean, she faced odds. There was also a, a narrative being played about the selfish nature of demanding equal pay, which is always a narrative that's pushed pushed across any labor movement for for that matter, even now. 
so uh, but uh, but that's and then trying to limit limit the fight that she represented into just the scope of tennis which was which was again when we look at it now with hindsight it was not and then the next generation martina navratilova came and she again was a avid uh, activist for lgbtq rights she was also openly gay and she also faced a lot of criticism i mean uh in the tennis fraternity itself people targeting her uh being caustic about her and this was pre social media era so she probably was saved from a lot of i mean uh, storm that that the athletes face now but but you were even even if you negate that aspect that it was a pre internet and pre social media era there was a lot of uh, attacks on navratilova while she was a player from rival fans to Uh, generally, to uh, patriarchal segment of of tennis followers and people in the tennis establishment, and Serena came subsequently again, taking forward that that fight for equal pay, which which has yielded results now. And Serena also stood um, off late recently after she became a mother. She also stood for that uh, that rights of, of a woman tennis player, because earlier the tour rules were such that. women would dread taking a taking a, taking a maternity break because they would lose their ranking points and they would when they return they would have to scratch from start from scratch but then a couple of years back wta changed that rule and they introduced this aspect that women would uh, a woman tennis player returning from uh, from uh, a maternity break would retain her ranking points and also would uh, would get a wild card uh, kind of entry into tournaments and into grand slams where she would she can potentially be seeded if her ranking was high enough when she left in the first place so that was a very that is a progressive uh, that was a very progressive move by wta and of course serena and a host of players were 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 uh, were the reason for that because they were very vocal about it and um, understandably i mean it's it it was very heartwarming to see that in this us open uh, the, uh, conducted under lockdown uh, there were nine mothers who were part of the main main draw right. and uh, three of them reached the quarter final stage which was unprecedented for a grand slam and then of course serena williams and victoria asarenka fought each other in the semi finals and asarenka reached the final and got beaten by osaka so yeah so this uh, if you look at tennis as a whole across generation there has always been women who have stood up and fought the system fought for rights fought for things larger than larger than what their sport is and the scope of the sport is uh, 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 so uh, this this i mean this precedent was set possibly because their journey in sport itself is a is a huge struggle it it and it it uh, starting from childhood possibly and then it continued through the through their careers where they face different obstacles as they, uh, when they reach a certain stage so uh, Uh, and it's also very clear that even if when you reach the elite stage also the struggle or the challenges are different uh, not necessarily what they faced when they were a teenager training and coming up the ranks so uh, they uh, i mean these struggles mold them to stand up for a uh, for a larger cause in life in general and using their professional standing and their and the platform that they receive being a tennis player for for that course and that's what happened with with osaka as well and so in this context of course we uh, the struggle for equal pay and has actually been very central to the whole discussion it's been going on for many years uh, and tennis that way does seem a notoriously conservative sport that way too but uh, what is happening with that right now if you could talk a bit about it because it has been a continuous demand for of women players throughout uh, throughout many years and still it seems quite far away or does it no it's it's not because uh, in the last few years things have gotten uh, better things are moving in the di- right direction and uh, some some of the slams have uh, including wimbledon have brought the uh, prize money of the women uh, almost on par with the men and uh, so so parity is i mean now the understanding is there and it's a, it's a, it's a huge change for the sport in itself because because of the i mean 
if you i mean it's it's pretty clear that ten, uh, you you use the politically correct word there the tennis is conservative so uh, across i mean it's not just uh, when we talk about men, men and women it's also there across race as well because if you look at tennis and the demography of tennis players the top 200 top 300 players uh, you can just count on your fingers how many black players would be there how many brown players would be there so it's a, it's a rich man's sport it's a white man's sport uh, white man and white woman's sport and uh, so it's uh, that way tennis has not cracked the race barrier but they seem to have cracked the gender barrier that way because because now more and more women are are, are benefiting from the from the uh, momentum that was that 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 this fight for equal pay gathered over generations and it was a fight that lasted generations not out but then it's it's reached a stage where things are things are better so when naomi osaka stands up uh, with a mask on her face presenting a case for for a larger case that she believes in she is taken note of and she is been taken seriously and uh, because of the stature that she has gained being a women tennis player with all the rights that she, that being a woman tennis player gives her accords right and in this context finally a quick question about india itself has any of this uh what do you call is any of this being even reflected in the indian tennis circuit because actually now there's very little talk about or you hear very little about indian tennis these days and what is a very quick look at the scenario there so uh, the uh, in, sumit nagal was there in the main draw of the us open this year i mean if you look at indians who featured in the us open uh, nagal played and second round he lost to dominic thiem the eventual champion and uh, rohan bopanna played the double straw in second round uh, he lost as well and uh, so that more or less sums up where indian tennis stands in the global scheme of things so india's best doubles player not progressing beyond the second round the third round and india's best singles player not progressing beyond the second round uh, having said that uh, that has been the story for the last 15 years or so where at the slams where we have been exposed except for the occasions when a double pair has clicked for for Leander Paes or for Sanya Mirza of course it's the partners also matter in that in that case as far as the larger global movement whether it touches the indian circuit we i mean in the sense as a professional set up in in tennis over here in india it's not reached a stage where it 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 it, it would matter because in, in any case our players are at the at the national level our players are at best semi pro i mean you can't even call them that because they are dependent on a lot of the federation or or the organizers or or the small sponsors that they get and it's they i mean if you if profession if being professional is Uh, the idea of being professional is earning enough to sustain yourself on tour and train and get better and compete at the various tournaments then uh, we have not reached there yet uh, so the support from the federation and the government for uh, taking these players to competitions it's 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 there uh, but as far as making a career out of of the sport we have to break into that the upper strata of tennis which we mm. haven't yet and right. and there are many factors to it one quick factor that i would like to mention now that we have spoken about india is that we lose our talent to ivy league mm. it's so the the it's a very tricky scene there because in the us if you look at it none of the us tennis players go to college because college, college what happens is that you can't turn pro if you are in college that's the rule of ncaa so if 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 uh, for, uh, any of the us players upcoming us players 15 years 16 year old gets into college then he or she stands to lose 5 6 years of valuable time where she she can grow in the pro circuit right. so tennis is such a sport while we opt to go to college because for us that's a window to 
to a parallel and i mean a tangential Absolutely. career path so we have lost a lot of talent on that and even even tennis players who have stuck to the game post that someone like somdev devarman who was india number 1 10 years back uh, he was he made it to the main row of a few uh, grand slams as well and somdev was ncaa champion so but then he came out of college and he was nowhere on the world tour so you can understand where it, where that where that loss happens to indian tennis right. it's just a just an observation and a side note to this but uh, the main point about this discussion like uh, was was surrounding women players and how they have always stood up uh, and so uh, adding to that discussion i would like to mention victoria asarenka the the runner up at the us open and the struggle that she uh, the personal struggle that she went through and uh, she reaching the final in itself is a is a huge victory right. she was in the middle of a custody battle she uh, had to leave the professional tour because of that uh, she because she the court ordered that she couldn't leave uh, california with her son uh, young son two year old son uh, so she decided not to travel around for competitions and stick on till till court decides otherwise and then now a favorable ruling has come so she has gotten back into competing so it just sort of uh, sheds light on how the state of women i mean i mean we are not talking about a commoner here we are talking about a very i mean a grand slam champion and a elite athlete one of the top players in at one point one of the top players in the world and she still has it proven by the way she reached the final this time and no one is immune to the the patriarchal setup that's 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 the hallmark of our society so so breaking that in itself is a is a is a is a big fight and i my reckoning is that these pioneering women players and i would call osaka also a pioneer for what she did uh, they they are forged to do these things because they are fighting the system right from the word go thank you so much leslie for talking to us our next segment is on the daily rights probes in a major development activist umar khalid has been arrested in connection with the riots and more arrests are likely in the next few days over the weekend we got to know that cpim general secretary sitaram yachuri noted academic jyoti ghosh and activist yogendra yadav were among those named in disclosure statements that were part of a supplementary charge sheet as part of the probe this riots probe by the delhi police is very symbolic of india today what should have been an investigation into the deaths of over 50 people has become an investigation into those who protested the caa npr and nrc and some kind of grand conspiracy they were all, all part of we are no closer to knowing who was responsible for the deaths we don't see signs of bjp leaders who made hate speeches being punished what we do see is students and activists being hunted down and painted out to be arch fiends we talked to sitaram yachuri on some of these issues here is what he had to say what is your response to this and what do you think is the logic of the delhi police in making these kind of allegations and these kind of statements well honestly you can't see any logic <laughs> there's no logic in this at all now we'll have to wait and see how they go into establish this link mm-hmm. between peaceful protests against the caa and rc npr with what uh, what would they call delhi riots but it was actually delhi communal violence now in that communal violence 56 or 53 people officially died now who is responsible for that any charge sheets if you are investigating that then that ought to have been your first uh, priority nothing of that sort then before this uh, violence took place there were these hate speeches incendiary hate speeches by a union uh, cabinet minister by a delhi bjp leader and according to that timetable announced by them this violence began any charge sheet on that hate speeches none so what is the police investigating and that is where the entire the the political uh, conspiracy aspect comes in the police is acting directly under directions from the union home ministry and there is a political motivation to this it is not really the question of delivering justice establishing the truth but to actually axe their political grind so this is this is what it appears from this very clearly 
and also I mean, when they say that no no he's not been charged cheated I mean the defense that they're giving right. now the question is how did this thing come into the public domain how did this thing appear and this is the methodology they they, they and they apply everywhere names appear in somebody else's uh, I mean, statement so so claimed or fabricated whatever it is and on that basis they procure orders for uh, you know framing charges and then they frame and then people are arrested under UAPA, etc. This is the way that Bhima Kore Gaon thing proceeded. This is the way the other uh, things are happening. So, I mean, this is a clear cut. It's a political issue. It is a state sponsored political maneuver, manipulation, a conspiracy, if, if, if it so be. So, that is what it is. So, I mean, that, that, that is not going to stop us from exercising our right to peacefully protest on what we think are violations for the constitution. And it's not only my right, it's my duty to protect the Indian constitution. And that is something we'll do. And that's why I keep reminding them, they should learn that I belong to that generation that fought the emergency. We re-established democracy in the country because of which they are also in government. And, and therefore, you understand, we fought that, we'll fight this also. Right. So in this context, uh, you mentioned, of course, the Elgar Parishad case. But uh, specifically with reference to the Delhi riots, it's clear over the past few months that, like you said, it's entirely been about the anti-CA and NRC protests and nothing to do about the violence. So is this the government trying to send out a message to the people at large that, uh, you know, if you protest this guy, is it like, it, it has a whole investigation become a way to threaten uh, free speech and protest? Yes. Of course, this is their way of trying to intimidate. That's what they're doing. Any dissent against this government is tantamount to their description of being anti-national and therefore the most draconian of measures like the UAPA, the NSA, the Sedition Act, they're all invoked. That is curbing of dissent. This is an outright large-scale authoritarian assault. And this assault is being mounted against Indian democracy and against the Indian constitution itself. And that is something that is just not acceptable. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with more news on the country and the world. Until then, keep watching News Click.